European Perspectives is here today with Professor Bob Pinedo from the VUMC in Amsterdam and the co-editor of the Oncologist European Edition. Professor Pinedo, thank you for taking the time to talk to European Perspectives. The European School of Oncology, or ASO, celebrates its 30th anniversary here today in Lugano with the World Oncology Forum. As someone who has had a long relationship with ASO, what do you think that this organisation has achieved? Um, Mark, I think this organisation has achieved very much. This organisation has been teaching young doctors, young oncologists, the cutting-edge oncology. And I have been involved myself since 1982, the very beginning, the second course actually, the first course was a breast cancer course a few weeks before mine, and I started the medical oncology course. And this really gave uh, uh, a momentum to my uh, career as well. It was a center thing for me because um, we selected very carefully our audience, our pupils, our doctors, and um, those which, who were promising. And uh, that went on year after year. For 10 years I did this in Northern Italy. And thereafter we moved to other places. And thereafter I participated in the master courses which were more multidisciplinary courses. And uh, if you look back, many of the pupils, many of the doctors in the audience became heads of departments in the world, in whether it's Brazil or Holland, many countries, they really became leaders in oncology. And they had very fruitful discussions during those uh, weeks because those courses took a week. We spent a week together, we got to know each other and, and we still see each other after 30 years. So it's really been something that has really like put uh, a, a way in which oncology can really move forward. Yes, it was really a tremendous teaching success and those people took it to their countries and so I think the ESO it's not only a European school, a European success, it's a worldwide success. Because we had uh, students, doctors from all over the world joining our courses. We had, at each course we had 40 students. So in 10 years, the first 10 years we did 400, we saw 400 young oncologists going to them. Some of them have retired by now. So it's really been a success like story. <laughs> and so I am very proud to be here. And, uh, and I'm proud also to sit on the scientific advisory board of the ASO still. And I am, I think, because I think the ASO has played a major role in the development of oncology, the development of the care of on in oncology, in Europe and worldwide. I'm very glad you said about the worldwide commitment of ASO because the forum that we have been attending here over the last day or so has involved a hundred experts from around the world talking on are we winning the war on cancer? Are we? Yes, I think uh, we are in the right direction for sure and if we see just we, we got the example of how uh, the, all the initiatives on smoking, stop smoking in the UK for instance, how they had their impact and how that is having impact in lung cancer but also other kinds of cancer. But lung cancer is the example. Uh, stop smoking, well we still didn't stop. So the success is not complete. But if we stop smoking, we know that we will have 36% less cancer in the future. That is a major achievement, 36%. And um, I think that uh, that was also an important discussion point during this forum. How can we achieve that? That's one of the 
the points that came back and back as part of prevention of cancer. Because I believe that that emphasis that the organizers put on prevention of cancer was very important. Teaching the public is very important. Getting, um, that is the prevention part. The, the care and the cure part are, have also been discussed. And I think that is very important. And one of the most important things is that everyone get the chance to get the care, yes, to, get the, to achieve the cure. And that's not something that we have achieved as yet. But that is, should be a goal, our goal, that everyone gets the opportunity to get everything that is available, the essential parts that are available to cure cancer and to discover cancer at an early stage. Absolutely, and we see, we, we've heard the figures being quoted a number of times during this meeting in relation to disparity, in relation to access to cancer care. How do you think we can address this very important issue? I think uh, we need to mobilize a lot of people. First of all, the doctors themselves. Second, secondly, we need to get the patients involved. The patients play a key role and to me the patient, the best patients who play a role are the patient who had the disease that we are addressing at that moment. Because they, a prostate cancer patient, cannot address the breast cancer. So we need to get the right patient on the right place and, some, and we need money to get the, the whole thing going. But we need to mobilize a lot of people, also the politicians, the people who decide, finally decide, and the people who decide about the money, the funds. So I think if we look at Europe, for instance, we really need to go to those people and explain to them what our goal is. But this is something worldwide, finally. But Europe is a good, for us, a good start. Important. Absolutely. As a pioneer of the European research er effort against cancer, where do you think we should focus our research resources over the next 10 years? Where we should focus in the future? I think I mentioned already the, the how to stop smoking. That doesn't seem exciting research, but it is very essential how we how we stop this. But uh, vaccination is one approach. And uh, the infectious uh, cancers are the cancers we should really focus on and, uh, and stop them. But also, um, in general, I mentioned smoking, yes, but in general, prevention. Because as I said, with smoking we achieve only 36% of our goal. We need the others, infectious disease. Overweight is also a part that is essential. Um, so there are many, many uh, ways we have to approach it. This is not one way, but teaching the public is very important. The public should be informed what the rights his rights are. And uh, that we can achieve through what I said, the politicians, but also the patients. And I think personally, a patient who has been sick is important to convince anyone. But a patient who has been saved through prevention, secondary prevention, or even stop smoking, should be that's not a patient, but a person who has been a success story because he achieved or she achieved to stop smoking should be mobilized as well. And the person who had a coloscopy and is beginning colon cancer, who didn't need adjuvant chemotherapy, who didn't need radiotherapy, is a 
one that we have to. That's address. a very interesting point that we, we so need to look at the I am successes is as well. The patient should be selected with care who we are going to enforce. So it's not one patient, it's a group of patients, and use the right patient for the right thing. Okay. One of the areas that you very much championed is translational research. Where, where do you think it fits in the current cancer care um, our involvement in relation? I'll just ask, ask that again. Okay. Uh, one of the areas you've been very much involved in developing is translational research in Europe. How well, do you think I that will com contribute to the cancer patient? I really started the translational research uh, in the 70s, very early stage, before I went to Amsterdam. I guess that's one of the reasons I arrived in Amsterdam. And uh, translational research is the research from bench to bed. And what is very important in my view is to have departments with laboratories within the department, not outside there, not in a different building, to have the basic scientists communicate with the clinicians, to have the clinicians working in the lab. Those people together are the best translational research right. researchers. So it's really translating yes. in both directions. Translating in both directions. Questions come from the basic science, yes, but questions come also from the clinicians, should come from the clinicians to the basic science. And the basic scientists should be responsive to those questions. In my own department, I even had the basic scientists spending one week every year in the clinic to communicate with the nurses. The nurses are very important. The nurses should be receptive for them to sit there for a week every year, each of them. And that creates a momentum that creates translational research, that creates good translational research. Yes, he very much hit the nail on the head in relation to everybody being involved in the process. That makes a basic scientist understand why the biopsies arrive at 4.30 in the afternoon. Why? Because the first operations ended, the big operations ended, so they stay to handle the piece of tissue that arrives. So if you have these people collaborating, you get top translational research. Absolutely. ASO and the oncologists have just signed a partnership agreement. And as co-editor of the Oncologist European Edition, what are your hopes and aspirations as to what ASO and the oncologists can do together? Well, I hope that the oncologists will be able to to uh, speak for ASO. And I hope that ASO will help the oncologists. It's a bipartisan effort. So we will help each other. But the oncologist realizes that ASO did top work during the past 30 years and would like to continue this, to help continuing this, this success story. And it's hard to boost it, but we will help boosting it. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Provenado, for an excellent and thought-provoking interview. Thank you. Okay.